Welcome to A Time for War. I am your host, Saint Militant, the patron saint of combating false ideologies. This is a Christian podcast for those who understand the times we live in and their enemies. Oh, yeah, we back, baby. What is going on? It is a time for war. I am your host, Saint Militant, and I got a great episode for you guys. Of course, once again, very excited for this. This is uh, going to be kind of a new one for me and a, a kind of a different format in a sense. Never really done this before, so I'm very excited. Uh, and uh, if you do like this discussion, remember, guys, to subscribe, like the video, share with your friends, and please leave a comment. It always helps uh, promote the show. Uh, and especially on X, uh, a lot of you guys promote my stuff there on there and it really does help, uh, just sharing with your friends really seems to really take off. And, uh, I am almost to a thousand subscribers on YouTube and, uh, I am going to make a quick announcement in the fact that, uh, around Thanksgiving when I have time, uh, and if at the latest in December near Christmas, when I have time, I am going to finally put all of the show on either on podcast formats. I'll be putting them on rumble uh and odyssey and i'm even kind of taking from uh, the other paul where i might actually just do uh live streams only on rumble because that seems to be a pretty safe platform to say all the spicy things i like to say so um yeah guys if you ever oh excuse me if you ever want to uh email me a video if you just have questions you know uh i do respond uh, I tend to respond more on X. I'm actually pretty good at answering messages. I do love talking to a lot of you guys. A lot of guys I've got to know uh, behind the scenes, especially those who listen. And uh, I do talk a lot on Instagram. So uh, please, uh, please go there and uh, just help uh, help me out. And uh, if we can get me to a thousand subscribers, that would be crazy. I'm almost there. I'm in like the eight hundreds. Never thought I'd be there. About five months ago, I was at like thirty eight. So the fact I'm even uh, at this number now is amazing. So, all right, guys. So this episode is a special one. Uh, I have Taylor from Antelope Hill Publishing. Uh, I love this company. I'm a huge proponent of this company. I advertise their stuff all the time uh, because I genuinely believe in what they do. And uh, the, especially the books they promote. Um, I have read a, I would say in the past probably seven, eight books in the past four months or so. I have read uh, probably about six or seven of those have been Antelope Hill. I'm talking some from British fascism to a new nobility of blood and soil. Uh, just Hitler by Wyndham Lewis, was, which surprisingly to me was probably one of my favorites. Uh, I actually have come to love Wyndham Lewis and his writing style. And his description of national socialism is actually dead on. And it's written for a British audience, and it's incredible and very insightful. Um, the British fascism one was one of my favorites, and I am right now reading, in his own words, the essential speeches of Adolf Hitler. Um, so I'm really in deep with Antelope Hill. I spend a lot of money on these guys, uh, and I do truly believe in what they do, and they've been huge in my own research, my own growth politically and theologically, um, and even my deep dives into national socialism, which I have been finding to be a, an ideology I think is very helpful uh, in understanding this world. And then, of course, uh, just seeing a lot of the, the overlap with my uh, Christian faith. So um, just uh, that's just a big intro for Antelope Hill. And uh, the book we're going to be talking about today is called The Sword of Christ. But first, I just want to introdu uh, introduce Taylor. How are you doing, Taylor? Doing great. Very happy to be on here. And congratulations on the growth of your channel. Thank you. Yeah, it was not uh, what I expected because I uh, it, it's funny. I always tell people this. My first half of my show uh, was definitely a very specific way. Uh, and then I had one episode get kind of popular. And luckily, my friend, the other Paul, found me and kind of launched me into space and has become a really good friend of mine. And uh, I, I'm always very grateful to him and always thank him. Um, but, uh, because of that, it's actually taking me in this direction and, uh, not what I expected. And so, um, that's why I'm that the fact that you guys even contacted me and was like, Hey, you want to do this? I was psyched. Uh, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I was kind of fangirling. Cause like I said, I've been reading your books a lot. So, um, yeah, the book that we're going to be talking about is called the sword of Christ by Giles, uh, Corey. Hopefully I pronounced his first name, right? But uh, I found this book to be uh, very, very interesting. 
Um, and uh, a lot of the information in it were things that um, I had been thinking about myself. He kind of confirmed some things that I'd been working through. And uh, I just, uh, when I finished the book, I was like, wow, that was a very intense book. I can see why that book is banned on Amazon and why people don't want uh, guys like me to promote it and why I got, uh, people don't want you publishing it because it is controversial. So um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, is there any reason why you guys particularly picked this book or um, like what, a, what, 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 how did you guys find him and, uh, and do, and get this book out here? Cause it is a very controversial book. Um, so uh, at the risk of being wrong about this, although I don't know if anyone would uh, know to correct me, I think the author submitted the book to us. Um, and so it basically just went through our normal review process, which is we receive a submission and we look at it and we determine whether we think we want to publish it. And uh, this one really uh, ticked a lot of the boxes. Um, it's uh, It's just, it's very well written. It's very timely it's um you know it's it's very aptly titled the sword of christ because the the book is is so polemical and um it covers it's basically just like going straight for the heart of a lot of uh the most important political and religious topics uh to christianity and to the intersection of christianity and uh white civilization and uh uh, you know, contemporary politics generally. Um, so we found that it was it was well argued. It was well researched. It was saying stuff that we thought was important. Uh, so we were very happy to publish it. And you know, we've we've published a number of Christian books. We also oh, we're not we're a secular company at the end of the day. So we'll publish Christian books. We'll publish pagan books. We'll publish other other stuff. Um, but you know, in in each case, there's I think certain commonalities and certain common criteria and uh, one of those is you know does it attack the things that this book attacks does it um, is it pro our western civilization um, does it align with that and this one absolutely does yeah i would totally agree with that um even the quote itself i uh i even marked it up greatly it's actually talking about islam uh it comes from uh raymond ibrahim which i'm actually reading right now i'm reading his book uh uh the defenders of the west and it says this if islam is terrorizing the west today that is not because it can but because the west allows it to for no matter how diminished a still swinging scimitar will always overcome a strong but sheathed sword and then, uh, so that's the quote. And then uh, Corey himself says, it is long past time to unsheath the sword of Christ. And yeah, it's kind of like you said, it does tick a lot of the boxes on the things that need to be talked about. And uh, I think one reason why this book really fits my show is one, it's called The Time for War. And it's all, and this whole show is about understanding the times and who our enemies are. And one thing I love about this book is it very bluntly, uh, describes who our enemies are. Uh, he has chapters that are talking about um, negative Christianity, essentially, which I've been talking about a lot. Uh, uh, Christian Zionism and uh, the Jewish people uh, of today, and then the uh, and then there's like whole sections on Islam. And uh, so, yeah, I thought this book was really, really good um, uh, when it comes to describing its enemies, the truth about the enemies that we're facing and the history of our enemies and uh, essentially uh, asking the question, all right, what, what are we supposed to do now, essentially? And he does give an answer. That's one thing I do like about this book. A lot of guys like to kind of pussyfoot around stuff in Christianity. This guy really doesn't. We'll get there because uh, that would probably be the last chapter we talk about. But um, any other thoughts before we kind of move on into the preface? No, sounds cool. good to me. Yeah. So, um Talking about the preface, I thought it was really interesting because it gives a long history of or just a long description of everything that's been going on in the past, I'd say, because this is this preface is from June 2024, and it just pretty much gives a big layout of everything that's been going on uh, of just like politically, whether it's the anti-white uh, hatred, uh, the Israeli 
um, attacks on uh, Gaza right now and the Palestinians and that whole question. Um, he, he gets into a lot of this stuff. He even He actually even describes a church uh, that's in an area that I actually have some family in. And uh, he actually kind of describes a church that I've definitely driven by uh, just driving around in that area, which is funny. I can't believe I actually knew what he was talking about. And um, so I thought it was really interesting. And uh, but the one part I really wanted to talk about, especially with you, was this idea of uh, when he brings up the Jewish people of today and the thing that really struck me was he said that genetically, um, the Ashkenazim who make up a great part of the population of Israel today are actually a, uh, they are like more genetically closer to like Phoenicians and Carthaginians. And so technically they're a Canaanite people. And he essentially says the twofold irony, uh, irony here is that um, the Canaanites were the ones that, ki- that were kicked out of uh, out of their lands by the Jewish people. And technically the Palestinians of today, the ones who are mostly Christian are genetically closer to the actual ancient Israelites. And so the twofold irony he gives is that what's happening today. And if this is true, the ramifications of this are very interesting is that the, uh, ones who call themselves Israelites today and took back this land, uh, are actually genetically closer to the Canaanites and then the group that's actually been there in Palestine and that got invaded and kicked out of their land and pushed into Gaza are actually closer to the ancient Israelites. So you have Canaanites claiming who are Jews, the actual Jews going after the genetic Jews who uh, are called Palestinians. So I remember when that was uh, when I read that, I read that to some of my family members and all of us just kind of stood there and we were like, wow, if that's if that's like fully true, uh, the ramifications of that are uh are pretty intense and um one thing he really pointed out was these ashkenazim who kind of have a clouded history of who they are um is that uh you know the one thing that we know about the jewish people today is they're very big into like pornography a lot of sexual deviancy and things like that and uh that's and and uh an abortion too and those are all things that the canaanites of old uh, we're very much, uh, of course, into and promoting and we're punished for, according to Leviticus 18. Um, and uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, maybe uh, if you've heard of this theory before. I have. I think it's um, I think it's interesting. There's I feel like there's multiple versions of this theory that are all in different ways by different means concluding that uh, the modern Jews are not the same as the biblical Jews. Um, Personally, honestly, I've kind of, I think I've mostly come around to it and it took me a long time. Um, I, I, I don't feel like it's something on which I would be qualified to like have a debate or even defend it all that strongly. Um, but I, I personally kind of lean toward the idea that indeed they are not the same people. Um, I think there's some, it doesn't like, I feel like sometimes people use that theory to solve certain problems or certain issues that they have. And I don't think it necessarily actually solves all of those. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, I mean, one, one thing that I think about is, uh, or that just kind of strikes me as, you know, if, if God promised them a land of milk and honey, then why are they all lactose intolerant? You know, <laughs> doesn't really make sense to me, but. That's, yeah, I didn't even thought of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and that's the thing, because I remember when I was reading, uh, I think it was, um, I, oh no, it, it was, it was White Power by George Lincoln Rockwell when I was listening to the audiobook. He does go into the, like the Kazarian theory, and uh, if you know, you look into the Kazarians, they're kind of like a, uh, like a Turkish almost kind of people. Like there was that empire, Kazaria, and things like that. Yeah. But but then I hear things like uh, that that theory was actually made by a Jew apparently to like get people off their trail or something. And I don't know. So like I don't I don't know. I I just this is one of those theories or one of those things. I do think it's true genetically. That they that they aren't tied to the land. I've heard other people say this too. I actually do think that's true. Genetically, they're more 
Eastern European, at least the Ashkenazim are. And so that definitely makes sense. Um, that part is, and then the part with the Palestinians be more genetically tied to Israel, uh, makes sense too. But, uh, did you have any extra thoughts? Um, I think one thing that tripped me up about it for a long time is I would normally see a lot of people use the Khazar theory as a way of actually like getting the Jews out of trouble uh, by like, you know, saying, no, no, it's not anti, like anti-Semitism is wrong because they're not actually mm -hmm. Jews. And uh, that, you know, I disagree with the, the impulse there and what's being done there, because it, in many cases it is um, a way of like not actually fighting the actual enemy and of trying to take the blame off of them. But if you're not doing that, uh, then th that is also something I've encountered that it's, it's um, it can be not like a um, excuse for the Jews, for the modern, you know, people who identify as Jewish today, uh, but a means of identifying further their otherness. Um, and that's the version of it that I'm more sympathetic to. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. No, not really. But I, I have heard that too, like those kinds of excuses. And, th and this is why I don't really try to play into this game too much because I feel like it gets too muddled and it confuses people. And all I usually just tell people is I, I just tend to think it's probably just a part of the diaspora that, yeah, these, these people probably are Jewish in the sense that like their descendants uh, did get kicked out. And then genetically over time, they just kind of intermingled with the people, you know, like the, a prime example example of this is like the Samaritans, like they were already considered half bloods, you know, like half breeds, yeah. the Jews. So like, yeah, it makes sense that they would then go up into Eastern Europe and just completely intermingle with like the Eastern Europeans. And then even those who go to the West, like you have the Sephardic Jews over in Spain. Like, I don't know, like they have like pretty much the same religion. They kind of act the same. Um, so I just I think it's just part of the diaspora. But um, I do find it fascinating that and, and that's the the irony part is that he's saying like these people are more genetically close to the Phoenicians, which were a pretty evil people group. And, um, and now they're kicking out like the actual genetic Israelites who we call Palestinians. So like that part, I remember when I read, I was just like, Oh wow. Like that's actually, I've never heard this before. Uh, that's actually a pretty big implication if that's true. And of course he even went into like the star of David, how that's not like a real Jewish symbol that tends to, that might, might even be mentioned by Amos and then uh, I think the other one is mentioned in Stephen's sermon to the to the Jewish leaders, uh, the yeah, star yeah. of Ramphim, right? And so, um, like nobody really knows. It's like a hexagram, you know. That's there, there's like also a lot of mystery with that. So the preface is very interesting with that section when he talks about the Jewish people. Um, the other thing I really picked up on, and this does relate to our day, it actually kind of connects to you guys is this, uh, this desire to shut down the conversation about the Jewish people and uh, even like national socialist literature because uh, and, and how the Jews really started to attack TikTok. Um, because uh, one thing that has been very useful uh, on YouTube, but especially TikTok, is that things like Hitler's speeches are like flourishing on that site. Uh, have you heard about this? Oh yeah, um, on Twitter as well, and and pretty much everywhere recently, they've there's it's been pretty big. But yeah, I definitely heard that that was a pretty big thing on TikTok. And like you said, TikTok, I'm pretty sure it's 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 still owned by a Chinese company, right? Because I know that uh, just like you were saying, and like he talks about in the, the preface, um, the Jews were basically trying to use the U.S. government to neutralize it and take it over. Yeah, it, it, they say they like this Chinese company has to uh, pretty much sell it or something like that. From what I remember, uh, yeah. but they I, they probably didn't. To be honest, they probably it's it's all it just seems like all like a big old scam. You know, they're just kind of beating their drums and blowing their horns and kind of uh, just trying to scare people. It seems like, uh, but the, the fact that that that's I, I remember when that started happening last year uh, when the TikTok thing really kind of blow started blowing up. Uh, I remember I just kind of was like, uh, yeah, there's a purpose behind this and it's not what they're saying. They're not, they're, they're going to say it's like anti-Semitism or they're, they're going to say it's, oh, it's cause it's owned by the Chinese. But in reality, I think what was going on also besides like the Hitler 
speeches, the AI ones being like, uh, you know, turned into English. The other thing that was happening a lot too is they were showing videos. Of, oh, that's why it was the October seventh uh, thing. Uh, a lot of videos were going out on TikTok of like Israeli soldiers doing some like really horrific stuff to like Palestinian children and and women and some really uh, you know like they'll they'll play like uh, one thing that even the preface mentions is that they'll they'll uh, play fake audio of women crying or a child asking for help. And then, you know, Palestinians will go out there to go, go look for them and then they'll shoot them. Um, so it was just things like that being exposed. I don't know if you heard about that also, if you had any thoughts. Uh, I heard about the inverse of that. And I actually, at one point, I managed to find it uh, basically acknowledged um, in a uh, Israeli source that the uh, that Hamas would play the sounds of like uh, children uh, playing to lure the IDF soldiers into ambushes in Gaza. Interesting, because uh, I was hearing the... That, so here we go with the... It's almost like war propaganda. It's like, because I actually... I think he even mentions it here. I can't remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's really funny that it's actually the opposite. I could be wrong, by the way. I completely could be completely wrong. Um, but yeah, that was like some things that were kind of mentioned here. So thank you for correcting me if that's true. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so there's just, uh, there were certain things like that in the preface that I really liked. Um, the big thing he really hits on is, uh, which is something I've been talking about. And I thought this was a really interesting point is he says this, uh, the eradication of Christians and Christianity is obviously a foreign policy priority of the United States during the American occupation of Iraq, the ancient Christian, uh, community where, uh, there was almost totally destroyed saddam hussein had been their protector just as bashar al-assad has protected the syrian christians from the entirety of his rule isis and other terrorist organizations all funded armed and trained by the united states massacred and continue to massacre christians in the ongoing uh western attempt to depose assad's government the entirely jewish government of the official state known as the ukraine has ruthlessly suppressed russian orthodoxy we could go on but it will suffice to say that the american government spends Hundreds of billions of dollars every year to extinguish Christianity. And uh, what's funny is I've actually been making that argument lately. Uh, if you go on my X account, I actually put up a video of Tucker Carlson talking about the same exact thing um, where I just I finished a book by Paul Ham called Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And when I was reading that book, one thing that really struck me was the targeting of Nagasaki and um there were certain uh, American, uh, certain American leaders who were trying to make it so that they wouldn't attack Nagasaki because there was a large Christian population that was there, and they knew that. And so uh, Henry Stimson, I think, was the one that was really trying to stop that. And then, of course, a lot of the uh, major leaders uh, kind of overrid him, and they they uh, they blew the city up anyway. And eighty percent of the population of Nagasaki disappeared of the or the Christian population. And I remember just sitting there and being like, man, this is kind of a crazy setup. Like you have like these communist atheistic Jews uh allowed to make super weapons, and then we use those super weapons by a supposed Christian nation, and we're going around destroying the Christian West, uh, and then we're blowing up Christian cities in Japan. And so I've, I was kind of doing this thought process and kind of thought experiment where I was going like, what happens if the United States is actually being animated by Satan and his minions and they're actually going around destroying Christianity? And ever since World War II, how come everything, almost every attack has been, uh, they say it's been on communism, but really if you look deeper into it, it's actually been attacks on Christianity. Um, you know, Christianity's pretty much dead in Europe, so World War II didn't really help with that and it's never recovered. And then uh, I had said that on my show, and then uh, Tucker Carlson goes on his and essentially says the same thing. Um, so I've been kind of holding to that opinion lately that I think the United States has been a tool uh, to destroy Christianity. I think Israel has a hand in this. Uh, and uh, I think there's some pretty good evidence that uh, that's probably true. <laughs> um, Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think um, another thing in the preface that goes along with that is talking about that uh, Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, which was being considered, I think, when did that first come up? Last year or this year? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which would uh, basically, uh, it's it's like 
it's so crazy when you read it. It's like it, you, you couldn't imagine that this would be something that that was true, but it would basically require the um, U.S. government to adopt and codify the definition of anti-Semitism by an outside group, the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Association. Yeah. So the like the definition of anti-Semitism legally would be whatever this other group says it is. And that would involve among uh, it basically would criminalize um, any criticism of the Jewish people. Um, and that would, you know, in practice, most certainly extend to just like individual Jews as well. But among other things, it would uh, uh one of the specific examples given as like anti-Semitism is claims of the Jews killing Jesus, which is just straight from scripture. So, you know, in a very real sense, it would be making the, the, the Bible illegal. Yeah. And they say that they have like a working definition. That's like the big thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's messed up. And, and I'm even reading right here, uh, that, um, he even explains that the ancient Christian community uh, of Palestine essentially has been getting bombed to death uh, and even shot by Jewish snipers uh, that they're purposely destroying churches uh, and they know that they're in there. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. The other thing too, that's uh, I, I've always told this to people when people say, Oh, you know, Israel's our friend. And I go, well, and he, and he mentions it here too, that Christian, this is a quote from his book. Christian evangelism is illegal in the state of Israel, and thus Christians are forbidden from sharing their faith. And I remember the first time I ever heard that. I, I, I didn't believe it at first. And um, and then I looked it up, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's actually true. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, and, and it made me feel a lot better when I read this book. And he kind of says all these things and I this book really affirmed a lot of beliefs I was already just kind of naturally coming to and uh and just my thoughts on the relationship between us and Israel and uh just some of the theories about them and as you just said this this working definition of anti-semitism and uh where they're getting their definition and um there's even quotes in the book of Netanyahu saying how easy it is to like convince you know, Amer Americans to support them and just like all this really crazy stuff. And um, yeah, it, it's it's kind of scary, you know, when you read it and you're like, geez, Louise, this is a really bad problem. But I thought the preface was was really good. I thought it was really compelling and uh, it had some really, really good uh, information in there. So if I ever need info and uh, as I said, if I hopefully I, I am wrong on that one point um, that you kind of corrected me on it, which hopefully that's true. But um, but there's also like a bunch of uh, quotes he has in here of just some of the atrocities that Israel, the Israel, um, the Israeli uh, government's actually committing against the Palestinians, which, of course, if you know anything about war, that's, you know, it's not shouldn't be too surprising. But still, it's not it's not great. So um, is there any other thoughts before we kind of uh, as we kind of talk about this idea of even negative Christianity or. Yeah, well, I think it's a good segue, but I think. It's um, it's almost it, at least to me sometimes it, it kind of like it, it this whole consideration kind of boggles the mind um, that you know the U.S. or what we kind of would like in an outward in a certain outward surface level sense identify with is responsible for. Um, all this stuff and and people's identification with the state of Israel, even the identification of Christians with the state of Israel, because it, it's so ever present. But then, like you said, you look into it and you see that the stuff that it's associated with is just straight up evil, basically. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's like it, it, it's really just like a complete inversion. And it's it's really it's really crazy. Um, I, I would also say that. Um, now this is more of my my personal opinion, but I I go for it. I I think, um, I would say what what's going on in Gaza is beyond just like war, um, sure. as as normal. Um, and uh, there's there's really no shortage at this point of like images and videos that that point to that. Um, and I think it, this is. It's my personal opinion uh, on this is that that it, there's uh, 
something that's important to understand because I think there's an element of our Gentile psychology that um, finds it difficult to process a certain level of inhumanity. And I would argue that level of if inhumanity is indeed on display. And that's something that we need to take seriously because it is something that ultimately um, is a threat to us as well, you know, especially with the, if, if we have this, even if you and I don't like it, you know, if, if we, our civilization has this close relationship with these people who are doing this thing and um, who are ultimately opposed to us and our way of life and to our faith, um, you know, they're showing their hand, they're showing their nature. And that's something that um, I think bears paying close attention to and, and considering how it applies to us as well. Yeah. I think that's a great way to put it. Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I tend to agree. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I say, and I said it, it's, it's, you expect things from war, but I've also seen a lot of the videos and images like they're, they're horrifying. And, uh, um, and that's what he kind of lays out in the preface, just a lot of the atrocities, some of the things that I've, like I've read and, and, uh, that he even brings in this book. So um, this kind of leads us into this next uh, chapter. He kind of just starts the book off with, uh, and I've been asking this question for a while too. And I, uh, I, uh, I really struggled with this for years. And if you actually listen to the beginning of my show, I kind of bring this out in the open a lot. Um, I got, I left a church uh, that kind of went through the woke stuff. Um, you know, just very stereotypical evangelical church. And as I started to move more rightward, and this is even before I got into things like national socialism or fascism or anything like that, anything more far right, I was, you know, I was kind of talking about theonomy and God's law and things like that. And like, even just that would cause people um, to just lose their minds. And I essentially got pretty much softly kicked out of the church uh, because of this. And, 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 I couldn't figure out why at the time, even though the things I was saying, I know were true. And the big thing was the anti-white hatred. And, um, and, and I could feel it coming from my old church. I, I could feel it. There, there was just a lot of like self-hating white people. They were promoting, promoting these ideas that our church was too white. And um, I just did not get it, you know, and I knew something was wrong. And I could just sense that there was just something wrong with Christianity in general inside of america like there was a sickness uh i didn't really know what to call it uh i used to just say maybe liberalism or and i was making the argue, argument in the first half of my show essentially that like there is there's this group that call themselves evangelical and every time they they proudly call themselves evangelical i'm thinking of like uh phil vischer or ed stetzer or uh just some of these guys that have criticized russell moore is another one uh, and he mentions Russell Moore in this book and does a lot of quotes. And it's just anti-white hatred, uh, race mixing, um, a hatred for our ancestors. And I um, I resented this. And I just, I didn't know what it was at first. I really didn't. And it, it this book really affirmed, uh, this is why I recommend this book for everybody listening, because it really affirms uh, pretty much everything that we've been talking about and what we've been working through. And that uh, one thing that I really like that he says is that um, there is a form of Christianity that is real. And this is why I kind of call it uh, positive Christianity in a sense. And there is a negative form of Christianity uh, and, it, and it makes people miserable. And I always connect this to like the national socialists and the quotes where you see them very critical of Christianity, like Hitler or even Goebbels to, uh, at some points. Uh, the book I'm reading right now, uh, A New Nobility of Blood and Soil, or the one I finished, um, from Dare, I think is how you pronounce it. Like He's very critical of certain aspects of Christianity. And, and sometimes they just say Christianity. And Hitler even says Christianity made people miserable. And um, instead of just getting triggered, I just started to go, well, no, there is a negative form of Christianity, and it does make people miserable. And I lived under it, uh, especially the anti-white stuff. Um, they do want to destroy Europe. They do hate white people. We're only 7% of the population of the whole world. So we're technically the minority. And they hate us. And I don't think it's a surprise that a lot of these pastors are promoting this stuff. And um, it's sick. And I think this is what Satan is using. I think he hates white people. 
And I actually do think to a point he is using these, he's using these other races to uh, try to eradicate, um, try to eradicate the white race and specifically white Christians, because technically we've been the protectors and defenders of the faith and the ones that have held onto it and spread it across the world. Most like most of the time through whether it was colonization or anything like that. So that was one part of his book that I really, really enjoyed. And it was very affirming to me that I'm not crazy. Uh, that there is a form of uh, that's uh, what he was saying, um, like a bad version of Christianity, like a fake version. And it's uh, it's very dominant in America right now. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, a number of thoughts. So uh, for one, I think kind of like you were saying, um, when when you make these kind of criticisms, like you probably can expect the reactions that you would get from a lot of people. But the issue with that is that a lot of these things are just true and they're not really deniable. Like a lot of what presents as the majority, the vast majority of what presents as Christianity is in fact anti-white. It is complicit in uh, the overturning of Western civilization. Um, it does uh, basically equate that with the gospel. Um, you know, it, 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 if you try to argue against it, then they'll, they'll argue back with you on, on the grounds of basically this is what Christ wants us to be doing. So, you know, if you make these, um, criticisms of Christianity, there, it's just stuff that's true and you can't get around it. And people will, you know, ultimately rather dishonestly when you dig into it, will try to, uh, argue back that, well, then, you know, you're not a Christian. Uh, but that's obviously not the case. And I think that that's with how present this is. And it, it sounds like this is probably a part of your experience as well. Like how ever present this is, um, it, it can be daunting to uh, deal with that because you can even face the, like ostracism. And um, uh, certainly you're not going to be the most popular person um, if you stand up for the truth and that makes it sometimes hard to figure out how to do that. Um, I think one, the, a way that I thought about it for a long time, and I still think that, uh, I still partly hold to this is a lot of people actually will say stuff like, you know, that isn't Christian or this isn't Christian. It's, you know, if you think about it, it's fairly normal. Um, and a lot of people, when they say that, they use it to kind of get rid of their own responsibility. Um, and, you know, you can pick maybe a little bit more of like a mainstream example for this. Like you have a church that uh, has like a female pastor or like a rainbow flag outside or something like that. And a lot of people will say, you look at that and will say, well, that's not Christianity. And um, sure, there's a sense in which it's true, but there's also a sense in which people say that in order to say, well, you know, I've identified it's not Christianity. Like, you know, my job here is done. I don't have to worry about it because it's, it's no longer posing a threat to me. Um, and I think people should have a much greater responsibility for, uh, for their faith really. And for the way that it presents itself. And if there's things that are presenting as Christian, but they are not, then it's not enough to just say that they are not, they have to be fought. And I think that is the attitude of the book. And in that context, to say that they are not Christian is correct and it's it's necessary because then it, it motivates you. And it says, well, you know, because this thing is not Christian, but it's presenting as such, it's my enemy and I have to fight it. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and especially one person. And if you ever listen to my show, like the early parts, I actually even read uh, an article talking about um, just kind of the subversion that these evangelical elites have, have done, specifically Tim Keller. And uh, even on X, I have said, I'm like, I'm glad that guy's gone. I'm glad he can't spread his filth anymore. Um, and I have actually held to the opinion that, no, I, I don't think that guy was uh, a believer because, I mean, he hated white people. I have listened to, I'm not kidding probably over a hundred hours of Tim Keller. And I've listened to a lot of his stuff on like race and the st stuff he's done with John Piper. And like, it's just straight up demonic. It's just so 
Uh, it's so gross what that guy was promoting. And if you just look at his legacy now, almost every person that comes from his institute or was uh, was taught by him, they also hate white people a lot. Still promoting this multiculturalism inside the church where they they say things like, you know, the population uh, or the demographics of your uh, church should reflect the demographics of your city. Uh, that's like something my church was obsessed with at the time. And, it, and they got it from Tim Keller. And, and it blew the church up. It caused so many problems. It caused so many divisions. And as you said, they, they would call themselves Christian, but I would sit there and listen to all this. And I'm like, there is no way this is Christian. And um, that's one thing that I just, I really, really liked about this book. And I really liked about that chapter. And he gives a lot of quotes, especially from, especially from guys like Russell Moore, and just shows that this is not Christianity. Whatever these guys are promoting is not Christianity. It's not helpful. It's making people miserable. And uh, it's destroying the West. And it's, I, I find it really gross. And uh, I suffered through it. And um, I still see remnants of it. Um, and I do see a lot of self-hating white people and people who call themselves Christians who want to destroy us and essentially just give up our inheritance and, our, and you know, destroy our, uh, everything our ancestors built. They have no interest and they've been completely disconnected from that. So, uh, um, is there any uh, other thoughts? Yeah. So, I think when you look at a lot of the stuff, and this is one thing that helped me kind of, um, like formulate to myself what's going on is if you can really just boil it down to the question: Well, is the gospel white genocide? Does the message of Christ mean that like the white race has to die? And I would say no. And I would say that that's intuitively obvious and true. And it's a complete uh, satanic distortion to say otherwise. Um, some people would agree, but they would act like it, it, in fact, that is what it means. And some people would just say, yeah, that is actually what it means. You're supposed to die to yourself, die to your flesh. And if that means that, you know, you give up uh, even the existence of your race, you certainly have to give up caring about it. Then that is the gospel. And um, it, for me, uh, and I, I'm a Protestant Christian myself, it's it's taken me a long time to, um, I think, uh, really kind of uh, grapple with, uh, and it is basically a parallel of just like my political journey generally, but to grapple with this and to come around with uh, exactly what you're saying uh, to the, the very polemical position that I think is necessary on it. It is necessary to be um, just completely uncompromising at this point with this stuff and to say, well, that, that is that is not Christianity. It cannot be presented as Christianity. If you are presenting it as Christianity, you are doing something evil. Um, and, uh, you know, it's certainly possible uh, that a lot of people, uh, you know, are uh, who do that are have no saving faith. And, you know, it's, that's always something that I think a lot of Christians are rightly hesitant to say, but I think at some point it's going to become increasingly necessary to say it because you can't refute it. Otherwise you, you, you know, uh, they'll say the same thing about you, you know, they'll be very sure. happy to do that. So. Yeah. I'm always very hesitant uh, to do that. But when it comes to these leaders, like I said, I've listened to hours and hours and hours and I just was like, all right, enough. Like, these guys aren't Christian in that sense. And the other thing, just the other aspect too. And if you, you can even say something uh, with this too, is uh, one thing I, I, I agreed with him is that uh, to move forward, I think we have to be racially conscious conscious. Uh, I have agreed with the fact that uh, it's, there's something transcendent. Uh, I've been learning this from Zach kid. His name is, who's been on my show a few times. Who I'm like good buddies with now. Um, he's really helped me to realize that there's something transcendent about uh, race and religion. And when a race really accepts Christianity as the, as white people did, and as Europeans did, uh, sometimes I use the word Aryan, if I was to be honest with you. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I think it's an accurate word. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I've I, actually I like it. Talking. Thank I, you. I think Caucasian <laughs> is the least possible, the, the worst possible word you could use. Oh, um, we're, we're, yeah. <laughs> sorry, you want to keep going? I'm sorry, I didn't mean. No, that. no, I was just jumping in. Yeah, I mean, white. I think white, Aryan, and European are basically synonyms, and they maybe just have slightly different uses, but they're yes. 
they're the way to refer to um, our group of people. Um, I don't like the term Indo-Aryan because a lot of people today take that to mean that like there's some uh, commonality between Europeans and uh, you know Dravidians from yes. the subcontinent, which is obviously not the case. No. And it's it's obviously just a cope. Um, so just you know, it's Aryan works for me. I want to normalize it, so I'm I'm with you there. Yeah. Okay. It's so it's so funny because the only other person I heard like openly call for this has been Zach. And uh, the first time I ever because I was going in that direction naturally, and I started to go, maybe we should use the word Aryan, right? Like, I really was. I was I was I was starting to get there. And then I Zach also kind of I just like the meaning that. of it. You know, if you the, yeah. if you look it up, the two meanings that it's traditionally uh, thought to originate from are noble or hero. Um, yeah. I think that yeah. says something that's accurate about our and not just our history, but also just our fundamental racial character, which I think kind of like you were saying, race is, you know, obviously something that doesn't just denote the color of your skin. There is a metaphysical aspect to it. There is a, a character to a race. Yes, absolutely. That is something I have learned reading either national socialist material and even things outside of that, even even Jewish books. Uh, like I always quote, I always talk about it in my show and everyone should read it is uh and it's um oh my gosh now i'm having a brain is it fart you gentiles no it's not you gentiles okay. uh, it's um uh oh a program for the jews and an answer to all to anti-semites by uh rabbi harry watton and he uses the word aryan he describes he actually says hitler's right he's like yeah they are aryans um, even like the you know weird book Atlantis, the antediluvian world by Ignatius Donnelly, he talks about the Aryans a lot, and he just kind of describes them as a certain way. And and it definitely, it's like you said, there there's something more. There's there's something skin deep to it. There's something metaphysical, and uh, that's something I've really learned even outside of things like national socialism. That like this is just how people talked, uh, and and yeah, and I've I've come to understand this, and I really do think if Christians, uh, white Christians, are going to survive this. We have to be racially conscious and we have to defend ourselves. That's the problem. And like there was a recent blow up with like James White, who just recently said that if you do that, you are essentially not a Christian. And it's just like, dude, come on. Like, this is not this is not how we're going to make it. Um, it's it's wrong. And uh, everybody else gets to do it except white people. That's essentially been, was the argument in this book, too. So uh, any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that actually did remind me of something else I was thinking of earlier, uh, and this is something maybe people will find helpful to think about, because once you think about it, you notice it all the time. And, um, it, you know, I'm sure you've heard uh, many times this idea of, like, race as a, a certain sin of pride, um, and there's definitely an implication, if not just an outright accusation, that, like, we white people are the most susceptible to it and you know any yeah. any whenever we try to do a nationalism that's that's a sin of of pride and yes. that's us like putting our uh earthly temporal material uh identity or self-interest over the gospel and actually like when you start to to pay attention white people e even like granting that this is in fact a a a sin that this is in fact something that uh we need to watch out for even granting that white people are the least susceptible to it like everyone else is who you see constantly identifying their material self-interest with christianity and it, you know especially immigrants because you know they're always it's there's nothing more obvious than the fact that it is like for them to be allowed to immigrate to white countries is in their personal material self-interest is in their interest as a race. They, like you said, they have a much, always have a much stronger ethnic uh, in-group identification and they will be more than happy to constantly associate that with Christianity and say, you know, if you're not opening their doors, then you're not a good Christian. So what are they really saying? You know, that they're, they're the ones who are, um, equating their material self-interest with the gospel. So, you know, e even kind of like granting that whole premise, it's obvious that white people are by far the least uh, susceptible to that. Yeah, I would agree. So um, <clears throat> the other aspect I kind of wanted to go to, um, I know I was good. I, I kind of wanted to talk about Christian Zionism. We can 
we can get into it, but I actually think this connects better. Was the one? It's very short. It's a very short chapter. Uh, and and I actually listened to the Stone Choir uh, podcast that you guys did with them also, and they were kind of talking about this, and they said there's probably some truth to this. They were a little more critical of this chapter, whereas for myself, when I read the chapter, I was pretty open to it, and it was the it was the chapter on the Germanization of Christianity, and. I think the problem that the Stone Choir guys had with it was like the more theory behind it. Uh, they were kind of saying like, oh, yeah, this comes from a, uh, I, f- I forget what the guy's name is, the guy who made this this idea up of that um, when the, the Roman Christians, we'll call them, the ones who came from the Roman Catholic Church started to go up into the more Germanic territories, they had a really hard time bringing the gospel to these Germans because they actually had pretty well-structured uh, societies. They like sexual sin was viewed as like a bad thing. Um, there was like a hierarchy that was pretty well balanced. Uh, they had a good view on violence a lot of the time. I know a lot of these barbarians are kind of viewed as like backwards in those certain cases. I think some of that is kind of, uh, it seems like that's kind of wrong. Um, and I'm actually going to connect it to that book, A New Nobility of Blood and Soil. Because he gives a whole history about this, and this author of that book essentially gives the same description of the German tribes that, um, that, uh, and even if you read the National Socialist Points, they actually talk and they actually talk about how they want to get rid of certain aspects of Roman law out of the German culture and the certain the Roman cultural aspects that have been in Germany. Um, They all seem to kind of have the same thoughts, and that's kind of what this guy is arguing. He's almost arguing that. Um, We need to go back to this Germanization of Christianity, where when the Roman Christians tried to bring Christianity to the Germans, it was very difficult because they also viewed Christianity as kind of weak. And so what these missionaries had had to do was they had to start presenting Christ as a warrior. So like a more like revelation type Christ, you know, coming down on the horse, uh, uh, covered in blood kind of thing. And uh, this is how uh, we kind of got our version of like this really muscular Christianity. That's kind of what he's arguing. And he's essentially saying, I think what we need to do is we need to hearken back to that era of we need a more uh, warrior king Christ for Christians. Christians need to be more willing to talk about maybe using violence uh, and um, and uh, going back to a more warrior spirit going back to the Germanizing of Christianity. Now, whether the theory is uh, true or not that Christianity was Germanized in a sense, um, it, that can be quibbled with. That's kind of what the guys from Stone Choir, Choir were doing. But I think the overall message that is really important to understand is that I do think he's correct that, um, and I know Raymond e- Ibrahim in interviews, I've heard him say this, is that Christianity was willing to defend itself. It was willing to pick up the sword. It was willing to fight. And maybe Germanizing christianity today um is actually uh, a good thing that we, yeah maybe we need to go back to our warrior roots maybe we do need to go back to that germanization um so i thought that chapter was very very interesting i even made like uh big notes on it uh myself and was just kind of like wow this is never thought of this i'd have to think about this more um i even said this might even be true like i wrote all these notes here um and even this idea of yeah he even actually he says right here i'll read the quote he says but thanks to Germanization, those elements were soon suppressed or muted. But we know, as the historical Christianity of the medieval era offered a religion, ethic, and worldview that supported what we today know as conservative values, social hierarchy, loyal to, uh, loyalty to tribe and place, blood and soil, world acceptance rather than world rejection, and an ethic that values heroism and military sacrifice. In being Germanized, Christianity was essentially reinvented as the dynamic, dynamic faith that animated European civilization for a thousand years or more. So he's actually arguing um, that that's where this, those ideas come from almost like chivalry and things like that. And uh, yeah, this, these social uh, hierarchies and blood and soil. Um, Once again, whether that is true, I guess that could be quibbled with, but everything I just read is essentially what we as Christians uh, on the right have been talking about. There's been this discussion of blood and soil. That's why I recommend everybody read A New Nobility of Blood and Soil because even though this guy's a national socialist, he sounds biblical. And that's one thing I've been really understanding. So 
Um, did you have any thoughts on that too? Sure. So I think um, people are, and I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the Stone Choir guys when I say this, just like the general reception yeah, sure. of, the, of this idea, but people are understandably sensitive to something that sounds like it's saying that Christianity needed to be informed by something that wasn't Christianity. Um, you know, that's very understandable impulse. So I think it's a difficult argument to make. But like you're saying that there is something to it. And I think it's, you know, I, I just think of um, Christ saying, uh, like he said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And who produced yeah. its fruit? It was the Europeans and specifically the uh, whole kind of Germanic uh, branch of uh, northwestern Europe. Uh, not not to exclude all the rest of Europe, but just because that's what we're talking about here specifically. So I, for that reason, I wouldn't view it uh, through the lens of like, you know, there was something insufficient in Christianity, but rather this was, to the extent that this process happened historically, it was the coming to fruition of what Christ promised about Christianity and about what Christianity would be. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was a great way to put it. Um yeah, I, and I, it's like I, I like what you said there that the response is uh, that you should be hesitant to say that there was something that needed to be added almost uh, to Christianity to a point. Um, I can, yeah, I would agree with that. But um, yeah, so I was I was just kind of kicking that idea around and kind of talking to people about that and kind of asking them like, what do you think about that? Like, have you ever heard that before? And um, and uh, everybody said no. So <laughs> I was not surprised. But um, so I thought that was a really interesting connection there. And then um, the other thing, too, was, of course, Christian Zionism. Uh, we don't have to go too long into this one. I, if anything, I, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, Christian violence, but uh, and what, what that would possibly mean in the future. But his his section on the on the Jews and then just Christian Zionism in general was it was um, really in depth. Uh, very convincing, very well researched, and he just flat out says this whole Christian Zionism thing is a heresy. And uh, there are particular people out there who really hate my show <laughs> because um, some of the episodes I have done, uh, very the one specifically that's uh, uh, I did about Adolf Hitler and his uh, what I called his great noticing, and uh, you know I read parts of like. Uh, uh, the, the elders of Zion, you know, the protocols and things like that and compared like other Jewish quotes. And then I was just talking about how Christian Zionism in general is just, you know, it's not good. So this guy essentially says that Christian Zionism, he gives a history of it, through the Schofield Bible. Uh, how did this nobody drunk uh, somehow get in the elite circles? And then there's this commentary produced essentially these notes inside of uh, the Schofield Bible. Um how it like how did this happen and then just pretty much describing guys like you know uh Hagee you know Pastor Hagee and his Christian Zionism the connections to uh the uh the creation of Zionism in the 1880s and 90s and even a little before that I guess but how it really took root and how it affected Britain how Israel was created and uh essentially that the fact that Christians think that um his big criticism was that the Christians, the Christian Zionists are essentially helping the, one of the oldest enemies of the church. Like we know this from the book of Acts that uh, the Jews, which are mentioned a lot in the book of Acts, are the oldest enemies of the church. But now Christian Zionists today are actually protecting our oldest enemies uh, have been to the detriment. We've gotten more Christian men killed because of Christian Zionism that this has real life implications of war uh, and uh, protecting a nation state that uh, openly hates us is very secular. Uh, even the creation of like the things like the temple, um, almost trying to push the conditions for Christ to come back and how all of this is actually extremely wicked. And a lot of this is also novel, that a lot of this is new. Um, it's more of like a 20th century kind of mentality. And, uh, yeah, so I thought this was an, a very interesting section. Um, is it, what are some th some of your thoughts on Christian Zionism? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying. I think that uh, what's 
well, well, at least, and honestly, uh, I actually grew up uh, the Christian Zionist. I grew up uh, very Pentecostal. So um, one thing that was completely novel to me was, like you're saying, just the character of some of the people who were behind this, like Schofield and stuff like that. That was something that when I first learned about it, it was completely new to me. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if you if you don't want to spend too much time on this, I won't necessarily go all that in depth on it. But like you said, it is um, it does make up a good portion of the book and it is a very good overview of the history of it and the problems with it. And it goes through how like the development of Christian Zionism and how it started with uh you know, considering both the, the Jews and the church and first, like there's an expectation that the Jews would convert and maybe they would return to the land. And then, you know, maybe those things would happen at the same time. And then it became, well, the Jews are going to return to the land first, then maybe they'll convert. And now we've basically dropped the whole converting thing. So, like you said, it's a very important topic. And it's also one where you can very clearly see how much this uh, pseudo theology uh, overturns uh actual christian theology and, and how much it 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 just you know there's no way of of um being a christian zionist without taking promises of god and statements from god's word that apply to christ and to the church and attributing them to this non-christian in fact anti-christian uh, group of people who you know, the Apostle Paul says they displease God and oppose all mankind. And there's there's no way that you can, once you start to actually dig into this and think about it, there's there's no way that, that you can justify it. And um, it becomes clear how idolatrous and how evil it is. So I think it's a, uh, a very, very good summary of the whole thing. And it's a very good tool that um, people can use for uh, deconstructing this stuff. Yeah, and I remember just in my personal growth, so I also came from a Pentecostal background. Uh, personally, I rejected it, of course. I'm reformed in theology now. and um, But I remember it was very dispensationalist, you know, very Zionist, and that's just kind of what I grew up in. I didn't know any better. But I remember, uh, you know, I started doing the noticing, and uh, it was actually through libertarianism and talking to some people in there who were, like, anti-Israel. I started to, like, kind of notice stuff, and you know, I wasn't too strong about it. But I, I actually started to come to this conclusion. And I, I, you know, I was actually having a conversation with my parents one time and I just said, I just said, you know, just just kind of do a thought experiment. Like what happens if this what happens if this people group truly is what people say they are throughout history? Like what happens if this people group truly are parasitic and they just have this disposition like this is just what they do where they go country to country and they spread degeneracy and they spread chaos and they spread political chaos. And they take over a country and then they kind of wither it down, you know, like, and that's just what they do. Um, why is that an unbiblical thought? Like, why is that such a crazy thought to have? Like, there are people groups that are more violent than others. There are other, other people groups that are um, more creative than others, it seems like, in certain cases. And so I just said, like, what happens if this people group uh, really just this is what they do? And I don't under, I don't see any issue with that. Um I don't see any problems with that. We we do this with other race groups and uh, other religions, right? We say this about Islam, that they have a tendency to spread rape and violence wherever they go and uh, cause chaos, as we're seeing. So why can't this be possible with the Jewish people? And a Christian Zionist, if you say that, uh, as you kind of pointed out, people get very upset by this. And uh, yeah, it's coming down to we're not even converting these people. Uh, we're, they're just, they're just their own group and they're just going to all be saved. And, uh, the, you know, people vote kind of go to Romans 11 and say these things. Um, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's messed up and it is, a uh, and of course there's the whole, the, the whole blood libel thing and all that. And he it hit that chapter was really hard to read. It was very sad. And I didn't realize the history in a lot of it, that even some of the Catholic saints were actually children who, uh, were found to be killed by the Jews through certain rituals and, um, one thing he really pointed out was like, wherever this people group goes, uh, this tends to be a problem. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to kick this idea around is that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of children disappear in this country. I'm talking hundreds of thousands almost every year. And I've actually kind of asked the question myself, you know, there's a lot of, um, Jewish people in power, especially in Hollywood. Uh, I've actually kind of wondered, I was like, I wonder if there's like a connection there. I wonder if there's something to that. Is this just the, 
you know, everyone always talks about like adrenochrome and all this different stuff. And some people can say that's conspiracy theory, but like, I don't know. I've just kind of, I've kind of kicked that around and I've kind of thought like, well, maybe there's a connection there. If like, uh, this is a real problem and we see this as a real problem and this people group from all the way from China to the Middle East to, uh, South America to North America to Europe and are in Africa are all kind of accused of the same thing. Uh, like why wouldn't there be a connection there? I mean, we can think of things like Jeffrey Epstein and stuff like that. So I really wonder if there's a connection there. I've kind of kicked that around, but once again, if you kind of bring this up to guys like Christian, Christian Zionists, you know, I would just be called a crazy person and, uh, anti-Semitic, but, uh, did you want to give any, any last thoughts on this? And we'll kind of, we'll, uh, hit on the last topic. I mean, I, th I think like you're saying, it's it's just true. It's a matter of historical record. It's a matter of um, empirical evidence that you can seek out and find. And again, when you look at how they behave today, it's it's exactly the same. You know, if everything that was said about them was true, how would you expect them to behave? Oh, well, it's exactly like what they're doing right now. So it's um, and, and there's like what 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 defense is there against that you know the christian zionists will just say that you just you can't criticize them because they're god's people which yeah. i think just kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier like that just has to be um you just have to say that that's that's anti-christian that's blasphemous it's it's just a complete perversion of uh what of christianity itself yeah i would agree and uh yeah so <laughs> i know that's what my one friend uh questioner he comes on my show a lot he's uh he says that all the time he's like just go look it up <laughs> like you don't have to believe me you literally could just go on google and just look it up uh 70 of joe biden's administration you know is, is is at the top is jewish like how does that happen you know it seems like this is the same behavior every time he always says that so yeah so that um the last thing i really wanted to talk about because this is something um, I think Christians really need to start getting serious about. Um, of course, I have to right out the gate say I am not advocating for violence. But I will say this is that uh, I think we have some breathing room right now with Trump. But I do think if Kamala Harris had won, this would have been a very uh, I think this could have been a very serious conversation. Um, I've actually had this conversation with my own pastor uh saying you know uh he even asked me if you picked up this what if you were called to defend the church and defend christianity by using the sword essentially or by using violence would you do it and i said absolutely i would um and by the way i'm not some tough guy i've actually never been in a physical altercation uh but um i would i would i would pick up the sword and fight of course today it's guns but um this this book, once again, is very, very intense. And he kind of starts with like crusader theology and just war theory. And then his final chapter it actually goes into um, if the government does not stop transgender surgeries of children, especially and abortion. Um, do Christians have the right to eventually step in, use violence? And he actually advocates for taking these surgeons and these abortionists and uh, shooting them. I'll just flat out say it. He actually does call for violence against these people. Uh, hence why he calls it the sword of Christ and Christians. Uh, we need to seriously talk about this. And I know men behind the scenes right now who are talking about this, that um, if it does come down to it, that Christians will have to uh, as our ancestors in the past have, that when the government becomes illegitimate through their evil and through their lack of um, through their lack of upholding the law to protect the innocent, especially children, that it might actually have to take Christian men to step in and to use violence to stop evildoers. And I have had this conversation with many people. I've even pointed out uh, it actually says in the Declaration of Independence that when if Americans do feel that uh, the government has become overly tyrannical or overly wicked, it is not only our right, but the founding fathers actually say it's our duty to uh, tear down that government and to make something new. Uh, that's very revolutionary. I am not bothered by that. Uh, if anything, I 
uh, I like ideologies like national socialism, which is revolutionary to a point. Um, and so uh, I uh, I really don't see any problem with his argumentation that uh, if it is a especially through just war theory, which Protestantism and uh, you know Christianity has produced uh, from Saint Augustine onward, that there is a time for Christians to defend ourselves. This is what the Crusades were. Um, as I said, I'm actually reading about it right now. And when you read what the Muslims were doing to Christians, the over pretty much the enslavement, the violence, the rape. Um, I think it was more than justified for Christians to gather together, band together, and go over to the Middle East and to, uh, yeah, kill um, kill uh, the Muslim hordes and uh, empires that were over there. Um, people, of course, disagree, but I, I really don't see any issue with that. I even say biblically, uh, people don't like this answer, but the Israeli kings did this uh, when Josiah or Hezekiah got into onto the throne, specifically Josiah. He went around and he put to death pagans and idol worshipers and baby murderers and uh, exiled sodomites and put sodomites to death and used violence. And now that was the, the state. But at the same time, uh, there are times where, uh, like our American Revolution, that there are times where uh, people do have the right, if they feel like a government is tyrannical, to uh, revolt and rebel and to, uh, and especially Christians, to. Uh, fight against this evil and uh, we actually have a precedent for this in our own tradition and in our ancestry as americans and a lot of christians joined the american revolution so uh and they put up with a lot less um americans today put up with probably too much uh our government is literally murdering children and talking about exterminating the white race and um literally killing us and we do nothing so I, I really I really liked what he had to say. I, I was not really bothered by it. I do understand what he's saying. And um, I think there might actually be some room for this. And this is something Christians really might have to consider. Uh, like I said, we have some breathing room. But I think if Kamala Harris had won, uh, I think this would have been a more out in the open discussion. I know uh, that it definitely was. So do you have any thoughts on uh, this idea of like Christians using violence uh, if need be? I don't think it's necessarily its consideration would be limited to just if Kamala had won. I think it's a probably just valuable consideration in its own right in any case. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts. I, I just a quick tangent just for my own like personal uh, go off <laughs> and entertainment basically. Um, I'm not super familiar with you know the actual ins and outs of just war theory. I have my own special take that i think it's too narrow and too restrictive and i think it's probably possible to um justify uh a more expanded allowance for violence uh from christianity than just purely self-defense um i would argue that violence in and of itself is not inherently wrong at all um and you know that would probably be its own uh, separate discussion. Um, I think that war is you could make a, an argument for war in itself being good in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a tangent. Back to the actual point, um, I I uh, I do agree. Uh, I think this is a very important and interesting discussion, and it brings together a lot of different things that we've been uh talking about so far um and one thing i i was thinking about was how you said earlier that we need to redevelop our racial consciousness um and i think even when it comes to this kind of thing to apply it like just to abortion um is it's i don't find it fully logical uh because abortion isn't the only pro-life issue in a literal sense. I mean, there's, uh, like you kind of mentioned, there's portions of the book that talk about uh, violence, historical violence against Europe, violence against white people today. Um, that's as a result of deliberate policies like open borders and stuff like that. Um, you know, like the transgender stuff that you mentioned as well. Um, so, 
I think the the only way to really make all this makes sense and, and make it cohesive is uh, uh, just like you said earlier, again, to have a, uh, a, um, a more racial, a collective understanding of ourselves. And um, it, because it, it is, I think it, it is my personal opinion that it, uh, we should also recognize that it's still difficult for people even if, even when people look back on the American Revolution, like I think even a lot of people today, you know, if you ask them, like, what would you have done back then? Some people would say, yeah, I would have done it. Some people would say, well, I, I don't know, uh, because this the whole idea of violence being something that's acceptable for Christians at all is has been so um, removed from our culture and our popular theology. I think we're in a very real sense with stuff like this we're not just rediscovering it but we're actually developing it uh, in a way that i don't think it was ever historically developed before that's just my personal opinion on it no i, I think that's really good yeah I, I i would agree with that yeah um yeah it's uh it, that's that's why i thought was really interesting about that section um because he yeah it's like you said he didn't even just talk about um he just said some of the strongest arguments is uh especially on abortion. Like he, he had a lot of biblical argumentation. I've said this too. Uh, even just in my own private life, talking to people, I, I constantly say to people, I was like, if you think that like, we're going to get away with killing that many children, even today, I'm like, you're crazy because God uh, essentially says these sins, like uh, murdering children and sodomy and all this crazy stuff, uh, this isn't just like uh, abstract sins like these affect the land. It actually says it pollutes the land. So these people who call themselves Christians and want to deny this idea of even blood and soil. Well, sin, once again, th doesn't just as we always say that, you know, that stupid phrase, um, uh, you know, hate the sin, but love the sinner. But that's it's not even true it, as if sin is this abstract concept that's not connected to the person. It is connected to the person. And God even connects sin to the land. He says it's polluted. You can't live there. And so um, that's that's uh, that's why everyone always says, like, oh, I'm glad the conquistadors killed the Aztecs. Well, guess what? If you think that's good, we're, we're lined up and primed for it, too. And this is why he's actually making the argument that uh, using violence to actually stop these people from murdering more children in the long run would actually benefit us as a people and actually protect us uh and and probably halt the wrath of god uh if we don't if we don't stop um and this is of course you know mutilating children this is also the attempt to genocide certain races and things like that as you said and pointed out um yeah it's, it's just very interesting and i i thought he did a really good job um uh i there was a couple of people i brought this up to and uh they kind of struggled with it and um it's funny. My pastor did. And my pastor was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. The conversation was great. Like he pretty much acknowledged. He was like, yeah, he's like, the reason why I asked you is because I had a feeling that like, that's where you stand. Um, and that's what you're willing to do. Uh, I even told him, I was like, look, I, I even think it's going to have to be race based to a point. He actually tended to agree with that too. So, um, maybe not as hardcore as me, but he definitely understood what, what I was saying. So I'm really blessed with somebody that I can talk to with that. But uh, yeah, the Christian violence part I thought was really just a really cool section. Uh, and once again, I think this is something that Christian men specifically need to start really openly talking about. Um, and as you said, it's not even just the Kamala situation, um, even under Trump. Like if this doesn't get any better, this is a, a brief moment in time. And then we just kind of go right back to it. And the country just continues to murder children and allow for, you know, homosexuality and transgender surgeries and all this stuff. If uh, Trump doesn't really stop this and then whatever regime kind of continues after him. Yeah, it, it's not it's not going to be pretty. And Christians might have to pick up the sword and uh, do it themselves. And uh, that needs to be a real conversation. So. Yeah, that is. Those were the major parts of uh, the Sword of Christ in, in this book, and uh, that I really, really enjoyed. And I kind of worked through um, things that uh, that I've, I've actually been picking up from. I and I think I said this to you before we jumped on. I don't know if this guy has is reading National Socialist material, uh, uh, but it, it, the, the Germanization part, and then a couple other pieces to it too. I was kind of like, I was kind of wondering. Um, 
uh, I was kind of wondering if he is. Um, so I, I was kind of working through that. So he essentially confirmed uh, and, and affirmed a lot of things I've already been working through, which is really cool. And the fact that you guys asked me to read this uh, was a blessing because, of course, I believe in sovereignty. And I don't think it was coincidence that I read this book and then there was other books I was reading at the same time and they all just connected. So I'm really thankful you guys did that. You reached out and uh, could uh, come on the show. We could talk about it. Um, it's been a it's been a pleasure. Is there any uh, last things you kind of wanted to uh, to say before we ended here? Um, I, I was just going to say on the last topic, I think it's uh, it's very clarifying to um, see a lot of the stuff going on as acts of war against our people because yeah. that's what they are. Uh, you know, every bit of immigrant violence is an act of war. Every aborted baby is an act of war. Yeah. Uh, if we're, you know, called upon to uh, die for the state of Israel, that is an act of war. Mm. So, you know, I think uh, a, a lot of the trouble that people have with some of this stuff, um, it should go away or it, it you know, if... At, at that point, it's it's no longer like a, a a logical problem. It's it's just a matter of of will. You know, once you realize that we simply are at war, whether we like it or not. You know, once you once you are at war, you don't get to like explain your way out of it or like say, well, oh, if I technically you know argue for how this isn't true, then it ceases to affect me. It, it currently affects you. It currently affects everybody. It affects some people to the point of of them uh, perishing. In fact, um, it affects people's souls um like you're saying it affects god's uh, whether god will will judge our land so you know maybe violence isn't isn't the first step um uh what is politics but a war by other means but uh, but there better be something you know there better be uh, an understanding that we are at war and uh and we should be doing something about it so um i just wanted to go back to that but um i uh, thank you very much for um, having us on. Uh, very happy to be here. So um, I don't want to. I don't want to like make you close out the show. I, I, I feel like I'm. I'm sounding like it's the end. So I'll just <laughs> toss it back to you. But um, just wanted to respond to everything you were saying. Yeah. No. And I'll say one last thing before we go. Uh, no, I'm glad you said that because this is why I've been so attracted, and this is why once again, thank you for what you guys do because I know it's probably not easy. You, pro you guys probably get you know, threats and people who will come after your company. But honestly, this one thing that Christians need to accept, and it connects to what you just said, is this is why I am so attracted to fascism and to national socialism. And I do think it is part of the Christian tradition, uh, at, at least in the sense of uh, the political side of it. Uh, people can try to run away from this, but there were Christians uh, who were national socialists. There were Christians who were fascists. And essentially, one thing I really liked from Oswald, Mo the book about Oswald Mosley and British fascism is Oswald Mosley said that fascism is, is an ideology of a uh, of a self-inflicted uh, civilizational collapse. That's what the point of the ideology is. It's a, it's it's a an ideology that's on the offensive in the sense of uh, and this is National Socialism, too. It's a uh, it's an ideology that's on the offensive. It attacks what it needs to attack. And then the things that it wants to defend and uphold. That's what it does. And it and it doesn't talk about it. It just doesn't think about it. It does it. And that's one thing I was always attracted to about those Israeli kings where they were the ones that instead of talking about the problems, they used violence to end the problems. And they, yes, they tried to use politics at moments, but overall um, they did use violence. And that's the thing about the fascists. They were willing to fight and they, and the, and to defend themselves. And they were on the offensive, and I really like that about those ideologies. I think we're probably going to have to do that again. That's my prediction. I do think it's going to come. I don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime, but if not, our our children and our grandchildren are going to have to fight it out. Um, it, it it's it's um I think it's going to get nasty. I I don't think just because Trump got elected, it's going to go away. So this is why I, overall uh, I've been reading the books I've been reading. Why I loved what you said where. You have to understand that we are at war. This is something I've come to understand. This is something that a lot of Christians are barely start are understanding right now. Some of them are a, lot, a good chunk seem to be kind of starting to get out of it, uh, especially you know, especially us who are openly right wing. But um, 
uh yeah so i just uh i'm just really glad you said that we are at war that's the point of this show um and so uh yeah so i'll end it here uh if you don't mind <laughs> but um once again i just wanted to thank you for coming on the show and uh guys one thing that's uh kind of new here is uh i do have a promo code for uh antelope hill publishing if you uh you would get a five percent discount for you and then uh, a five percent uh you know uh, uh, to help out the show uh goes to me so that would be a really big help and uh the promo code is a time for war uh all together all uh lowercase uh i will put it in the show notes down below um but uh I, I guys, I really do recommend look at Antelope Hill. I, I'm on there actually pretty frequently, always looking for books. Uh, Christmas season is coming up. I spent uh, maybe two months ago, a month and a half ago, like ninety dollars, almost a hundred bucks on books from Antelope Hill. Um, I even promoted it on my ex. You know, made it look all nice, and you know, took a picture of it. And uh, also, they give you awesome bookmarks. They gave me this one book. Actually, they gave me two, where it says literally Hitler. And they're, they're like eighties looking. They're awesome. So this company's great. Um, and the, what they're doing, I truly do believe in it. And I'm very thankful for them. Uh, and so please uh, use the promo code. Not only will it help me, but it will help you. And also, of course, we want to fund Antelope Hill as much as possible. Because uh, if we if we truly believe uh, what we believe and we want to educate ourselves on what we believe, this these guys are vital. And so. Um, uh, at this point, I would defend Antelope Hill, man. No doubt. You guys are great. So uh, thanks for coming on the show, Taylor. Um, I just, I really enjoyed this. Um, and uh, love to uh, do this again and uh, talk to you guys again. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, sure thing. Anytime. And thank you again very much for having me on. Of course. And uh, yeah, so guys, this is a time for war. I am your host, Saint Militant. And of course, don't forget. There is a time for peace, but now is a time for war. All right, guys. So next week, we will have some more episodes. We'll get back into the book, White Power. We'll continue our discussion uh, about why young men are uh, attracted to fascism. And I will see you there. All right. Bye.